Good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin. Welcome back to the ESP32 product creation journey. We are still going through the learning curve of free RTOS and a bunch of things there. So in this uh, stream, we're going to cover a little bit uh, a follow up from the laps episode um, and are going to be playing around with C, C++ and again, playing with some of the features of um, free RTOS, um, ESP IDF, C, C++. Um, all of that. So first, before we get into that, a couple of things. One, if you are not in the Discord server um, that's in the description for this, you got to hop in there. Uh, we've got, I don't, I only know how to pronounce his um, handle. It's Eager, I-G-R-R, -R, who works at Espressive. He is putting straight fire content into the server. He's watching uh, some of the streams, which if you watch this, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, and then is putting just an incredible knowledge into the Discord server of, you know, things to documentation links and ideas for things to try based on feedback from uh, the videos as we're going through here. And so uh, a lot of great information going in there, hop into the Discord server. Um, there's a great group of people in there, still small. Um, and so uh, some good conversation in there. All right, a couple of things to clear up from the last stream. First of all, one of the big things that we got hung up with, and I don't have that window open yet. Um, one of the big things we got hung up with was the uh, task stack. And I was really getting blown away by how huge it was because if you look at the free RTOS documentation, uh, and let's let's just do that. Let's, let's pull this window over. There we go. Nope, it's not pulling over. Come on, Pop OS, help me out here. And um, yeah, I think this is the window we want as well. Okay. Free RTOS tasks. Um, what's the best way to find it? Is there a search? Task and coroutines, task introduction, uh, implementing a task. Let's say X task create. Okay. You can pass it a US stack depth. And if we come down and look at that, it says the number of words, not bytes, exclamation point to allow to allocate for use as the stack, the tax stack. So something to be aware of that I learned the hard way and you painfully watched me learn the hard way is that ESP IDF is built on free RTOS. And so uh, most of the stuff that you look at in the free RTOS documentation, I believe applies to ESP IDF uh, development environment. This is one case where it does not, and it's important to read the docs. So what I was doing was I was taking the number of words, multiplying it by four to get bytes, and then coming up with like some huge number for the stack size, like 8,000 bytes. And then I was using the high watermark um, call, and it was showing that I was almost out. And I was trying to figure out like, where are these thousands of bytes of stack going? And that uh, was because I didn't read the documentation, which I always recommend you read the documentation. But <clears throat> if we look at, um, let's see if I'm on the right page, S task create. Um, okay, task create, the same thing, you pass a stack depth. But if we come down to here, uh, that's not what we want, I need a link to it. Uh, oh, here we go. The stack, the size of the task stack specified as the number of bytes. Note that this differs from vanilla free RTOS. Um, <clears throat> so it's right there in plain English. Maybe it would be nice to like bold that to draw your attention to it, but I don't really think that's the problem. I just didn't, I didn't think if, if you don't know to look for the difference, you're probably not looking for the difference. And this was a case where I didn't know that I that that's something that diverged from free RTOS and eager again in the discord gave a um, a short version of a what sounds like a very interesting story of how it came to be that way in ESP IDF, but it doesn't really matter how it came to be that way. That's the way it is. And so when you specify the stack depth in IDF, you are specifying it in bytes, not words. And so that made a whole lot more sense 
um, after I spent, even after the stream, I spent a good hour or so like going back to my computer science days of like, how do you calculate stack uh, usage? And by the way, very interesting um, learning from that is stack size is d very difficult to predict just by looking at the code. Um, so there's that. It's it's because of there's so many variables that go into that between compiling and, and what different tool sets use and what they put on the stack that you're not aware of that are being put on the stack. It's not just as simple as what are the params that are passed, what are the local variables, and like the depth of calls. It's more complicated than that. And so just FYI. Um, okay, so we got that all squared away. The other thing I mentioned in the last episode was that I would prefer to write in C++ as opposed to C. Well, I started writing some super gnarly old school, and I'm not proud of it, and I'll show it to you, code to create like a, if you've ever run the top command on Linux, it'll show you like what processes are running and how much, you know, CPU time they're using and memory and things like that. It's like a, a very knockoff version of that on the ESP32. And I'm going to check something real quick. My sound levels look like they're being really high. Um, so I apologize if I'm like over gaining here. Okay. Um, so anyway, I wrote this. Um, oh, where is it? Like I'm doing some really hardcore like mem set, mem copy, like moving stuff. And the result of that, I'll show you. Plug in my device over here. And flash monitor. I'll let that build and print. Takes a second. Hope everybody's having a great week so far. I'm tired. I did some yard work today. I'm getting too old for that. Okay. Every few seconds, it prints out this nice little name, stack, CPU, and core. So this is the name of the thread or task. This is the high watermark or what I like to call like as, as little stack that we ever achieved. It, Oh, uh, what's the best way to explain it? I, I still hate high watermark because it feels like I, I picture it as like using up the stack and then freeing it up and things like that. And this is the value of like, this is how close you came to running out. If this number right here gets really close to zero, you're you're on the edge of overflowing stack. Again, we're going to do a huge shout out and thank you to Eager in the Discord, linked up a whole bunch of information about how you can detect stack overflows and a bunch of different uh, approaches to um, seeing how close you are to overflowing stack. Great information. Like, I can't thank you enough for posting that in there. And hopefully other community members are taking advantage of it. And so the CPU right here is the CPU percentage. Right now you can see idle one and idle zero are uh, taking most of the CPU time because nothing's really running. And the core, this I, I made it print out this tilde, tilde, tilde. If it's task, no affinity, meaning when you create a task by default, IDF can choose what core it wants to run it on. You can pin it to a core and say, I only want you to run on zero or one, but if you don't specify that, it'll run on either core. And if we come way back up here, hopefully it hasn't scrolled out of the buffer yet. You can see right as you start up, like idle zero's low CPU, and you've got these IPC one and zero, which as you can see, correspond to core one and core zero. We're using most of the CPU, but that was, so that's the very first report. And then the second report, you can see we're back to um, idling, basically. So right now, the ESP32 is idling. And uh, at, in addition, I printed out this heap free bytes. Um, that's the total number of bytes that are free on the heap. And this is the largest free block. So this value right here is the largest value that you could malloc at any given time um, due to fragmentation of the heap. And so, and... I just wanted to print that stuff out, first of all, to get my feet wet with writing a task and to better understand like how stack and memory and CPU usage look on um, an ESP32. This is 
I mean, I could just run this with whatever task. And right now, I think it's like every three or five seconds uh, that it's printing out. Let's see, every five seconds. I could change this to be not so frequent, but excuse me, this was just me messing around and I'm not proud of the code that got us here. Something that I want to play with right now is, um, as I was alluding to just a minute ago, was I said I wanted to write this in C++ and not C. It's not so cut and dry because there's so much overlap between the languages. Um, but I realized as I was writing all this gnarly stuff last night, or two nights ago, whatever it was, this mem copy and pointer arithmetic and all that other stuff, that that's not the C++ way. Like that's anti C++ because C++ has a whole bunch of other things built into it that make that make writing code like that um, easier, uh, less verbose and more like secure. I, I don't mean secure in the sense of like hacking, but I mean secure in the sense of like uh, memory allocation and keeping track of that and cleaning it up. In, in raw C, you're doing the memory management yourself. You're allocating, you have to remember to free um, access outside of ranges. You need to make sure you're being careful on. In C++, there's a lot of um, built-in library stuff that takes care of that for you so that you don't have to worry about it. And I mentioned something in the previous stream where I said there's a lot of no cost or low cost abstractions in C++, meaning you can write this code in C++ that um, gives you all these benefits and doesn't really add a lot of overhead as far as code or memory or anything like that. Um, low and no, well, no is no cost would be, it's exactly the same. And there are some things in C++ where people have shown when they break down the assembly, like there is really literally no difference between the C and the C++ version. And the C++ version is a little bit nicer syntactically. Low cost abstractions are ones where, yeah, it's more, but it's acceptably more given the benefits. But low is relative. And that's what I wanna play with right now because I was messing with something a little earlier today and I think low cost abstraction in the, when applied to embedded is going to be um, too much cost ex ab abstraction for some things. Again, I'm not gonna just bail on C++ altogether, but um, I want to explore a little more what I saw earlier. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna comment out this X task create report or create uh, report heat memory. So that won't run anymore. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come into main launching memory task. And I want to, uh, what's the best way to do some code like this? I wanna put a bunch of strings together and I'm trying to think of how to like set up this completely contrived example that I have in my mind. Um, we're just basically appending things over and over and over. I mean, this is not the only way to do it in C. Let's let's get that out of the way. But for example, up here, the way I wanted this to print out is if I log manager it, I get this information like time and the tag, but you can see my output is nice and clean with nothing preceding it. So this is all one big string buffer and I build it up over time. And the way I do that is I allocate what I think like gross bug laden code of just to see if it would work um, of like a very, I, I gave about 30 bytes per task times the number of tasks plus 53, 53 is a magic number. That's the length of all this stuff right here that I wanna add at the top. And then what I do is I keep this current spot pointer and I basically just append, like I've got this giant area of memory that I've, that I mem set with spaces. <laughs> I told you this is ugly. Do, do, don't take this as a, this is how you write good code. This is how you write awful code. Um, and then I basically move it along to create this, you know, what I think is a very beautiful output of everything, the, the tasks that are running. So that's how you would do that in, C. Now, 
So let's take a, an example of uh, S printf. Let's do that. Okay. So let's say we want to print out. Um, we want to print the value of a variable is, and then we want to print out the value. And then um, we want to put an exclamation point after it. Okay, let's just say we want to print out that string. So what we could do is we could just say, give me a char array of uh, stir. And then we need to allocate, we can either statically allocate it like I'm about to do right now, or we could malloc it. Um, that won't really matter. That will matter where it's stored in memory, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on flash program size here. Um, we would say the value of a variable is whatever that value is. So what you need is you need at least this number of characters, which if we see, we've got, you can't see it because it's behind my head right now, 26 characters selected. So it needs to be 26 plus whatever the value is going to be, plus the exclamation point, 27 plus the value, and then a null character at the end, 28. So I'm going to choose some arbitrarily larger value of 64. I like to do by twos. And then what we can do is we can say S printf, which means we're going to use a print formatting function, but store it into, uh, we could do printf. Maybe that's one way to start with it. We could do a printf, which will write it out to the console for us, but S printf will put it into a variable. And so in this case, we want to store it in stir. And what do we want to store? We want to say the value of a variable is, and then we can do, let's just say it's an integer. So we'll do percent D and then we'll put an exclamation point after it. And then we can pass the value of that variable right here. And we'll call that variable I to keep it simple. And then we'll declare I, I equals 10. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. Um, and again, the compiler could optimize things out. Like the compiler is likely going to notice that we don't use this thing anywhere and that it's constant and it, it's going to, the compiler is always your best friend and it will try and help you the best it can to optimize your code, even if you don't write it optimally. And so once that's stored, it'll put the, uh, it'll null terminate it for us. And then we should just be able to do something like log manager info and say print out our stir okay so let's first of all make sure that this builds <laughs> and it doesn't i was not declared in the scope yep because you got to give it a type int i okay all right so that's going to build for us now before we program it we're going to come back to um, our shell here. And we're going to say idf.py size. So this will tell us it's going to compile it. And then it's going to tell us how big is this binary going to be? Okay, you can see right here, we're going to copy this like we did before when we were playing around with our, oh, you can't just hit control C, you got to hit control shift C. Um, we're gonna copy this over here. Okay, so this is um, the C way. All right, and then, so we're looking at around 218K. We're looking at the total image size. I'm not really worried about the memory right now. That memory can be different if we wanted to malloc the space for our string versus statically allocate it. I'm not really worried about that. I'm looking at really this flash code and read-only data, okay? And then we'll say the C++ way. Now, a way we could do this in the more modern C++ way. Oh, well, before we do that, let's, uh, let's program it and make sure it works. Flash monitor, okay? And I know this might seem more peripheral to building an ESP32 product, but I think you'll see where I'm trying to get as we finish these tests. 
Um, oh, it says it needs to restart, and I didn't hit it. Restart task. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, why did, oh, I know. This is from before. We, we saw this before. Uh, we need to flush. Um, uh, what do we flush? Standard out. Like that. Uh, what's happening is it's this main task and at main, since I don't while forever. Uh, yeah, it doesn't like that. Um, F flush. Oh, I can't remember. I'm going to have to look it up. I'm just guessing at this point. Oh, did I get it that time? There we go. Um, because we're basically terminating out of this at main task, it doesn't have a chance to flush, and then it just never outputs. So this should fix it. OK. The value of a variable is 10. Great. OK. Now we're going to comment that out. We're going to comment out our char here. And then we're going to use something called a string stream. And this is more of a modern C++ way of doing this. And we're going to say standard string stream um, stir. We'll call it stir still. And then what we can do is we can say we can just use the operator like this, this error error operator, say the value of a variable is do a space and then we can pipe through i and then we can pipe through an exclamation point like that and then we can log manager info main and now this is we can't just pass it stir because it's a string stream but we can oh, i named it horribly um Let's call it SS string stream. We can say SS dot stir, which gets the string representation of it. And then we can, we need the C stir version of that to send to our logging library, a constant char star. Okay, that should work. Let's try to build that. Nope, hates it. This was not declared. Uh, yeah, because I didn't rename it up here. build. Okay, that built. Now let's test it. Make sure it works. Flash and monitor. Uh, no. Flash and monitor, please. Thank you. Okay. And so now it's going to be using this. It has to build in the string stream uh, code into our application um, to be able to print it out. And oh, why did we? Did I get rid of the? I did. I got a flush. This is where, if you're watching, you got to catch me on these things so I don't forget. Okay, so this would be, and you can see, I mean, at least for me, this looks a little nicer. Um, I know it's just one line, but going back up to this up here where I'm doing all of this pointer math, I redid this this afternoon with string stream and it was, it collapsed all of it into a single line because I can just pipe through and I don't have to worry about any pointer um, things. I don't have to worry about overloading the, the area I've malloced because string stream will re-alloc things if you need to. It, it takes care of all of it for you. And so, okay, it works. The value of a variable is 10. Great. I mean, if we're looking at these, they're not super different, right? All right, now let's come over here. And I believe we're going to see something interesting here. Okay. Let's take a look. Total sizes. OK, 
Okay, the C++ way. I didn't change any other code. All I did was use string stream. And check this out. Look at our flash code. We went from 87, um, 87K up to 200 and almost 50K. And like, this is almost 218 to 399, almost 400. We almost doubled the image size just by using string stream. And so that sort of really deflated my C++ balloon a lot. Um, because that's crazy. Like that, that's, depending on your code base size, I mean, everything's a trade off, right? Like I could say, yeah, and then doubled, but I don't care because I like using string stream and it, I like writing code that way. It's, I prefer it. But at some point, we've only got so much flash space available. We're trying to break that out into multiple partitions to do OTA. This is not a trade-off that we can make at this point, given how much code we need to write for what we're trying to accomplish with the product. Um, and I would venture to say with this kind of size increase, there's not a whole lot of like great C++ built-in standard library stuff that you're that you would want to use this way versus doing it the C way um, because that's just huge. So that is really going to kind of slow my roll a bit on C++ and how I want to write that code, which is fine. I have plenty of C experience to be able to get everything that we need done, done in C. But this is just something that I wanted to share um, with you to, to show that yes, you can write C++ on the ESP32 and it is supported. However, um, you're gonna pay for it like pretty, pretty heavily. Um, this would, again, low cost abstraction is relative, right? Like low, it, if you're talking on a desktop machine, this difference in bytes, nobody cares about like really. Um, on an embedded device, this this is no longer, to me, qualifies as a low code abstraction. This is a um, huge code <laughs> extract. Um, uh, I, my brain's getting tired. Um, abstraction. So one other thing I wanna show while we're talking about this is something that Eager shared in the Discord. And um, I'm gonna have to look up where where he was that he said it pull this over here um about a setting that we can use uh doo -doo 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 -doo. it's about um the nano like we can get a a, a smaller version of the c library but he was saying that that more has to do with um, printf and things like that. Um, but we could try it. Let's, uh, let's try it. Okay. I'm going to link the one, the, the site that he, he put in here. This is this config new lib nano format and it says enable nano formatting for printf scan F family. Um, so I think this would more help us out with the S printf that we did if, if at all, um, and not as much with our string stream. So, uh, but let's play with it. Let's, let's see. So we're going to bail on this version of C++ um, for things like this. I'm still going to do um, C++ object stuff like that. That is still what I would cost a uh, call a low cost abstraction. Um, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, so let's bail out on all of this. It was fun while it lasted and bring this back. And then let's just mess and see what the what the difference is. So I'm gonna do size again. And we're back down to 218. I think that's what it was over here. 218, 404. We would exp uh, 420. Uh, these don't always come out exactly the same, um, but you know, it's in the general ballpark still there. 218, 420. Um, and now let's um what was it called again 
new lib nano format. So let's go into our, oh, in past streams, I'm just gonna pass along all of, I'm giving credit, eager, this is all eager, but I'm gonna share it with you so that you can get the same benefits if you're not in the Discord server. I have said in past um, things that I like menu config because it has that old BIOS look. Um, we can pull them up side by side, actually. Let's do that. IDF.py, menu, config, or you can pull it up in Visual Studio Code like this with the, um, so you've got this kind of a UI look, modern, fancy, you can search parameter and things like that. And I always said, I really like navigating this because I, for whatever reason, I can navigate it a little better, even though this is kind of similar to this over here. Um, but I said I would use this when I didn't know where it was, I would use this to search for it. And Eager specified, I'm gonna have to look it up, I think he said forward slash. Um, you can press forward slash, then start typing the query, it will show the list of matching symbols. Um, so let's give that a try. So in the top here, I would do a search for nano. Ah, and there you go. Enable nano formatting options for printf scanf family. And that's why I would say I would use this, the Visual Studio extension, to do where I didn't know where it was located because I'm not sure, and he did tell me, but let's just pretend. I'm not sure which of these that would be under. But he says that we can just type forward slash down it. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to hit forward slash and type nano. Eager, you're amazing. So much help. So, so great. Um, all right, there you go. You can search. They've thought of everything in, in menu config. Uh, and then I like it. I don't know that I'll ever go back to using the, the VS code thing. So now if I hit enter on that, now it'll tell you where it's at. You can see top I'm in component config and new lib, and I can see that it's right there. So let's, Enable it from here. Um, and then let's save it. Yes. Let's close it from up here. Cool. Uh, now let's do IDF size again and see if that changes the size of our sprintf. Uh, there are some caveats to using the nano version, which is a few things aren't available, but there's documentation on what that means. and. Um, I would suggest if, if you look at that and you don't need those things that you should use the nano version because it cuts down on code size. So let's see where it's got to, anytime you change anything with menu config, it's got to recompile everything. Um, and so that's normal. It doesn't do just an app compile. And so let's see if we got, if we got and how much we got. That's no joke. That was nice. Let's take a look at it. All right. Come over here. We're going to relegate the C way down a little bit. And we're going to take this and say the C way with nano. Okay. So instead of 218.404, we're down to 176.104. So that was a that's a pretty significant reduction in flash code size. Um, and then we got to do it. We got to flash and monitor and make sure that it still works. Restart task. Okay. So these are some of the things that we're learning as we're going through. And this is great. Um, I really, I want to be writing code towards the product, but I'm, I'm, I got to build all the groundwork to make sure that I'm writing, first of all, good code. And that is independent of what, you know, platform or framework you're using, but also knowing like how to leverage and get the most out of the platform that I'm using, which in this case is IDF. And so, and here we go, works just fine. The value of a variable is 10. Uh, one of the things I do know won't work with the nano version is that like 64 bit integers won't properly format, which I don't have a use for. And so that's, that's a totally fair trade-off. 
Um, but if you do need that, obviously you, you would need to uncheck nano. But these are things, I mean, um, I am gonna, I said I'd never use it again, but I'm gonna use it again. Um, Cause I think it's a good way to illustrate it. Um, if you look at this, I mean, hundreds, hundreds of settings and combinations of settings over here um, that I didn't know about Nano until Eager mentioned it. And so that's something where, you know, dozens of K of flash code I would have been using needlessly. Um, and that's specific to IDF, you know, in this environment that I'm working with now of using that different, and they give me an option to use the different C lib. And so these are, these are things that you learn along the way of like, you know, that's a, that's a huge optimization that I wouldn't have known unless I, you know, front to back read the documentation for um, IDF. And that's a good thing to do, but not, com you know, entirely realistic when you're working on building something because, um, well, I mean, when was the last time you read the whole tool chain manual for any tool chain you used? You know, these are things that you you pick up along the way. And so hopefully that that, that can be helpful to, to some of you in your projects. Use the nano version of CLib um, when you can. So, all right. I think I don't really have anything else planned. What are we at? 36 minutes. Next steps. So... I think I mentioned that I've chosen BLE as the way to provision. Um, oh, for those that watched a few episodes ago, we never got the console version working. Uh, Eager linked us that. Just call this episode like Eager's a Beast or something. Um, you have to go in the legacy code and there is an example of that. So let's take a look at that really quick. Maybe we'll we'll close on that. I don't know if we'll try and, and get it working. Uh, but for those that are just joining us, we a few episodes ago, we were trying all of the different provisioning methods for getting Wi-Fi credentials stored on our device so it can connect to a Wi-Fi network. And we, were, we tried BLE, soft AP. So BLE was we used a, an app on the phone to connect over Bluetooth directly to it, transmit... Um, information that way. Soft AP is when the device acts as an access point, broadcasts its own SSID. You connect to that network and exchange credential information that way. And we also did smart config, which is a um, also with a phone app. Uh, Espresso has apps for all of these things, by the way, to make it easy. That um, broadcast does a really cool um, use of the UDP spec to broadcast um, SSID and password using the length of packet. It's wild. Uh, I suggest you read about it if you want to nerd out for a little bit, um, which is just another way over Wi-Fi um, that you can get the credentials stored on the device. So we tried those three approaches. We were testing like what's the, the user experience like, what do the code sizes look like? BLE is the biggest by far, followed by soft AP, followed by smart config, um, biggest to smallest in that order. And then console is another one that's mentioned in the unified provisioning docs, but I never figured it out. Um, and Eager noticed that and said, hey, check out this example, which was in the legacy, if I remember correctly, it's in the legacy uh, folder. Yeah, provisioning legacy. So he linked me to this. Um, so I was coming into provisioning and when I see legacy, I tend to ignore it because legacy oftentimes in my mind, I associate with like deprecated or to be deprecated or like, don't do it this way anymore. So I didn't look there. Um, but he suggested check it out. Um, console provisioning. Okay. Yeah, because even here, I think I maybe even did come here and it says for any real applications, it is recommended to use the new, um, which is based on the simpler Wi-Fi provisioning APIs. But maybe from this, there's enough information that we could figure out um, console provisioning. So um, UART console is chosen as the mode of transport over which the provisioning related communication is to take place. This sounds exactly what we were trying to get working. Basically, we are picturing um, 
Well, so this says to run the ESP prov pi script, which I didn't get to. Okay, so you do have to. So they still want you to use the provisioning Python script. Okay. So, and then let's look at the, let's actually take a peek at the code. From data, start service, set security group. Okay, this is, it's gonna run through a bunch of different uh, events. <clears throat> okay, app is provision, configure STA, start provisioning. Okay, timer, create args, register handler. App prop start service. I probably blew past that. Uh, create a new protocom console config protocom console start. So this is okay. And then I'm I'm imagining so like on the where is it on our old hardware with the P1. There's a similar thing where it by default will accept serial commands. Like if you type I after connecting a P1 module to your computer, it will print out info. If you press, I believe it's W, it will do a Wi-Fi config where it will just throw up a prompt and say enter SSID and you type it. And it's just communicating again over serial. I'm imagining this looks something like that, a little more advanced or a lot more advanced. Um, and then storing those credentials um, on the device. And so very cool. I, I'm not going to, at this point, try and get this code to work. I don't, I do want to have the ability at some point to get credentials over the UART as like a last ditch effort. Um, if a customer is having a problem, like being directly connected to a device over USB is kind of hard to Fail. Lots of things. I, I've said this in, in a video a long time ago. When you understand how all this stuff works, it's amazing that any of it works. Like radio waves bouncing across the room, like even just the radio waves going from your phone to the ESP32. It's it's amazing any of this stuff works, but you know, you're you're going through that medium. It's very reliable and it works most of the time, but there's so many things that can go wrong. Um UART is, I would say, much more solid when. Um, it's just, hey, plug it in and you should get serial output. You're talking directly to the device. Um, and so I do want to have a UART option available, but I don't think I'm going to mess with trying to get this working just yet. I'm going to focus on Bluetooth, uh, BLE specifically for provisioning to get our Wi-Fi credentials stored. So anyway, I just wanted to, to maybe tie a bow on that follow-up that console can indeed work. There is, you know, working application here. You just have to come into the legacy folder and you would be able to provision. So lots of options, console, soft AP, smart config, BLE, um, all options for you to get uh, Wi-Fi credentials onto your ESP32 device. So I think that's going to do it. I can actually feel my voice starting to get tired. It's been a long day. So uh, that was kind of a smorgasbord episode uh, covering a bunch of different things. So use the nano lib if you can and be cautious on that C++. Uh, you're going to pay for it in flash code size. So those are so there's, those are the takeaways of the video today. The third, which I'm going to bump down to number one takeaway is eager being in the discord is a great benefit to all of us love having him around. So uh, check out the Discord server. Again, there's links in the description for how you can hop into that um, and check out the community there. So that's going to do it for today. I appreciate everybody who's joining in on the journey. Um, 
thank you to everybody that's reached out and has had positive things to say about how they've enjoyed uh, certain episodes and how we're covering all this stuff. Really appreciate that. Kind of fuels me to to keep going and and sharing it because sometimes it feels like, you know, why would anybody care? But there's a lot of there's a lot of me's out there that do care about seeing this and find it interesting and helpful. So hopefully we can continue to to help and inspire you to work on your projects and and get them moving and. Uh, you know, make it happen. It's the best time ever to be alive working as a maker and doing internet of things. Things are so accessible. The tools are readily accessible. The cost to do things have come so far down, uh, which is which is really great. Uh, doing this stuff 10 years ago was just not as easy and was crazy more expensive. And so great time to be alive, to be an IoT maker. So uh, thanks again for watching. Hope everybody has an amazing rest of their day and we'll see you next time.